Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on Managing MS Early, Get Ahead of the Disease. My name is Ann Lee, and I'm the Senior Specialist of Programs and Online Education for Can Do MS, and I'll be your moderator this evening. In case you're not familiar with uh, who we are or what we do, Can Do MS is a provider of um, empowerment programs for people living with MS and their support partners. Um, we help people to move beyond their MS by giving them knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors. Uh, we empower people to actively co-manage their disease and move beyond their MS. And we do this by, um, by programs that we put on, and, and you can find out about all of our programs by going to our website at www.mscando.org. Um, you can look for upcoming webinars. You can also view recorded webinars that are archived on all of our websites, or on, that are archived on our website. And uh, we also have in-person programs that you can learn about and see if we're coming somewhere close to you. We have our four-day can-do program. We have our one-day jumpstart programs. And we have our two-and-a-half-day take charge programs. You can also connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook uh, where you can find out about up-to-date information about our programs and events that are coming up. We're on Twitter. And we're also on YouTube where a lot of our older um, webinars are stored. And just to um, go over a few housekeeping issues, um, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to chat your question to me. And there's a chat feature um, on the left-hand corner of your bottom corner of your screen. So just chat your question, and we will receive them, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, so all of your phone lines have been muted. Um, and you can either chat your question in or raise your hand, and, and I can chat with you and ask you what, what your question might be. And before I introduce our speakers tonight, I, we just wanted to get a better feel of who's on the program with us. Um, you should see a polling question on your screen. And we're, we're asking how long you've been diagnosed with MS. And you know, just pick whether it's 0 to 5 years, 6 to 10 years, 11 to 15 years, 16 to 20 years, or more than 20 years. Um, or if you're a support partner, you can just click um, Not Applicable. Um, so we'll just wait a few seconds to view those results. And it looks like uh, most of you are uh, newly diagnosed with from 0 to 5 years with your MS diagnosis. Let's see, OK, I think. We've got them all in, and so here are our results. So 52% of you have been diagnosed for 0 to 5 years, um, and about 16% between 6 to 10 years and 11 to 15 years. Great. OK, so now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the program. Um, Deborah Miller uh, is a member of the professional staff at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis Treatment and Research of the Cleveland Clinic. She's also the Associate Professor of Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Her PhD is from the Case Western University School of Applied Social Sciences. As a master's prepared clinical social worker, Dr. Miller's practice, fo int practice interests focus on marital and family adjustments to the consequences of MS, and she has lectured nationally on these subjects. Her research focuses on health services research, including developing a health-related quality of life assessment tool for adults and children with common neurological conditions. Dr. Miller recently completed a study titled Using the Internet to Improve Self-Management of Cro Chronic Illness. She was also a member of the research, te research team that developed and validated the Multiple Sclerosis Quality of Life Inventory. And our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Linda Walls. And Linda Walls has been a practicing occupational therapist for approximately 25 years, with the majority of those years at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Her experience has been in many areas, including neurology, neurosurgery, and trauma. Many of those years have been spent working on inpatient rehabilitation units. Recently, she has been working with children who have fine motor coordination and visual perceptual difficulties. She has been a member of Can Do MS's program staff since 1993. And it is my sincere pleasure to welcome Linda Walls and Deborah Miller. Thank you very much for that introduction, Anne. Um, I'll be, uh, Dan, or, um, 
Linda and I are going to be doing sort of an interview style back and forth between, our, between us so that we'll be talking for a bit and then asking each other questions and having a chance to have a rather informal conversation with you and with each other about some of the issues that um, persons who are early in their disease um, experience. So um, we're hopefully opening a door to, for you um, to explore ways to manage your multiple sclerosis in terms of your emotional, social, and physical well-being. We know that each of these contribute to who you are, and we want to make sure that we pay attention to all of them um, as we offer some suggestions to you about how to proceed. For many people, um, obtaining a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis can feel like entering a maze, um, both in terms of the healthcare system, in terms of different kinds of insurance, in terms of how, they identify the, how you identify yourselves, and questions about what the future will be like for you, both in the near term and in the short term. So with so many of those questions being common to individuals recently diagnosed, we're hoping to help you navigate the, the maze so that we can help you get back on the road to life as you want it to be. Um, and I'd like to point out that the people in this picture who are using the walking sticks for their um, chomp in the woods do not have multiple sclerosis. They're just using good adaptive devices to help keep them steady. Okay, I'd like to start with asking Deb, um, what mindset do you find adopt when a person has been recently diagnosed with MS? Um, thanks for that question, Linda. We know that many people experience MS as a totally uninvited guest that shows up without warning moves into every room. Um, no one knows what to make of this new person in the household, and it doesn't go away. So while life may at first seem somewhat chaotic, um, living with the diagnosis of MS, what we hope to do is encourage people and offer you ways so that you can not have this perfect closet on the right with everything perfectly arranged, but have a place for multiple sclerosis in your life so that it fits in and does not take over the rest of your well-being. Another way of thinking about this is that every person is made up of many pieces of a tightly fitted puzzle. Um, you may think of yourself as creative, as um, warm, type A person, and and how suddenly becomes an additional piece of this puzzle that is you. What we recommend that you think about is finding a way so that you can fit that extra piece of the MS puzzle into your personality without letting it become the entire puzzle. We want you to find a place for MS and to put MS in its place. Um, Linda, while we know that there is no straightforward path to adopting to MS, how do you recommend that folks who are recently diagnosed keep up with what is important to them? Well, what I'd like to do is start with saying that, you know, with everything you have to first take a step back and evaluate your lifestyle. And what I um, mean is it's really important for you to start with taking time um, Look at yourself, look at what's in balance, maybe look at what's not in balance. Um, and when I mean look at your lifestyle, I, you, know, you need to review your days, your weeks, not what was going on two years ago, but what's current, what's current to what's going on um, in the past days and weeks. Um, you need to look at do you have time for activities, and, and I mean activities that you enjoy as well as activities that you have to attend to. Um, it, and then think about is most of your day spent at work, is it household responsibilities, 
child work. These are the different issues that you need to kind of um, go through your mind and question yourself so that you can get a better perspective on your lifestyle. The next thing I would recommend is to actually sit down and make a list of activities. How many hours are you spending with household responsibilities? How many hours um, are involved in your work responsibilities? Um, here is a list just to kind of help give you some um, guidelines which says, you know, talks about some of the major categories of how our life is spe our, our day is spent and those include self-care, work, sleep, family time, leisure, household responsibilities. All of these pieces come together to fill in our day. And then of course our some days might be a little bit heavier on household responsibilities versus work, but in a general sense you want to get a feel for how your day looks and how it all adds up. Um, maybe you didn't realize that um, between household responsibilities and work, no wonder you haven't had time for exercise. And this um, taking the time to make this list and think about your time will help you understand how, where your time is being spent. Um, we're, what I'd like to do is um, when we talk about um, you know, keeping everything in perspective, what I want to emphasize here is just the balancing of our lifestyle. And an important part of balancing is also staying connected. Um, it's an important part of your life. Staying connected includes family, friends. Um, now that you have a diagnosis of MS, staying connected is just as important, but it may mean that you need to make some changes or some modifications. For instance, it may not be a late night dinner party that you enjoy, maybe an earlier dinner and being able to talk with your friends or your family and change, adjusting some time um, to what works better for you now. Um, a full day of shopping might need to actually ha be broken into parts where you have a sit-down lunch and get a little bit of rest. Um, you may have previously enjoyed exercise groups and you may need to make some adjustments to the type of groups you're going or the length of the group. Um, but what's most important is that you stay connected and that you don't allow MS to cause you to kind of pull away from people and, and friends and family. Um, what we were talking about here was how to deal with people in your lives, letting them know about your MS and how to manage it. And we have um, on this slide um, a family of several generations, um, a couple who for purposes of the discussion, are, are recently married. Um, a person who's in the workplace and recently diagnosed. And then the fourth picture represents long-term friends who are important to you and with whom you want to maintain um, an activity. And for many people who are recently diagnosed, they do turn back to their family of origin, to their parents oftentimes, for some support, um, especially during times of exacerbation, perhaps when they're having difficulty um, with managing emotionally the aspects of MS. And different cultures and different families from different cultures manage that in many different ways. But what um, people tell me when they're first working with their family and living with their family to deal with this, um, it's very important for them to feel as if they don't go back to a point in their relationships with their families of origin when they were a very young person still living under their parents' roof, and that they want to be able to help their parents and other family members understand how they want to receive help from those who love them so much um, in terms of not all of a sudden taking over decision-making about your care um, or deciding whether you should move back home. That's something that is very important for you to communicate clearly 
if that's your style, um, that you will let them know and ask for the kind of help that you need. Um, in some cultures, it's just absolutely normal to move back home, and it, people don't have any difficulty with that transition. But for most people, it can be um, a certain challenge to renegotiate your relationship with your family of origin after a diagnosis with MS. Um, for the couple who are here young, um, I, for my purposes, I'm thinking of um, recently married. It's important to come up with a language to discuss the MS. There are many hidden symptoms that other people do not see. And it's important for two people who care for each other and live together on a daily basis to have a way of not being overly watchful, um, not overly concerned, or on the other hand, too dismissive of what the symptoms may be. So it's very important to work on how to talk about the MS and to not have it dominate the conversation. It's also important to keep in mind that oftentimes people have couples, um, people in, in couples who have different, have different styles for managing how they re react to this recent diagnosis. One person may want to read everything that can be found and needs to be completely in the know, while the other person in the relationship may be a bit more standoffish and needing this time emotionally to absorb. It's very important for people who are close and um, sharing a relationship to respect each other's styles and to give each other room while still keeping the conversation open. Um, the third picture is um, a group of people who work together. And in my mind, I haven't quite decided which one of these three people actually have MS. But an issue oftentimes that people ask about is what they should tell their employers and their coworkers. And typically, especially when persons are recently diagnosed, we recommend that you not reveal any more than you're comfortable revealing, um, especially to employers, that it's useful to talk in terms of symptoms if you're having them, but not necessarily in terms of a diagnosis. And it's very important for people to come to respect you professionally um, for your accomplishments and then appreciate what um, accommodations you may need because of MS in your life. So it's very important to approach the topic of MS in the workplace slowly and in a way that's comfortable for you. Finally, um, that picture is of apparently, or to me, two very long-time friends. And sometimes people feel as if their friends sort of fade away after a diagnosis of MS, that there's a sense that your longtime friends are not comfortable with the diagnosis, don't know how to talk about it. And actually, I think that oftentimes they're as uncertain of how to, look, to, to deal with this diagnosis as you are. And in some respects, it's important for you to be teachers and guide people on what they can do to help, what's not helpful, and to let them know that it's very important to you to maintain these relationships. Um, Linda, I think that at this point um, we were going to talk about um, any final words that you may have on keeping up with the social relationships in persons in people's lives. Um, yeah, what I just again in summary, what I'd like to do is emphasize the importance of staying connected, and that sometimes that may mean making accommodations to your relationships. Um, how much you talk about things, how often you talk about your diagnosis versus other components of your life. Um, and staying connected also means managing those new relationships. 
So, but in summary, what we want to do is make sure you have some goals when you think about your social relationships and make sure they're relationships in which you're comfortable sharing, sharing the driving, sharing the planning, um, share, sharing what you are comfortable asking. For instance, if you're not comfortable talking about your diagnosis, but you still want to have assistance with a carpool, there's no reason that you have to explain that because I have MS, I need to have a carpool. I, I think what's important here is making sure that you continue to make good uh, communication with other people around you and um, you know, make sure you're comfortable regardless of what you're um, sharing with them, but you're also staying connected with them. Um, Deb, what that we wanted to talk some more about emotion, and what I was going to ask is we have discussed how to manage MS in the context of physical and social well-being. What are the important coping skills that can help a person with MS to maintain physical, social, and emotional health? Well, first of all, I think that it's very important to understand what's normal in terms of receiving a diagnosis of MS. Um, people may find themselves asking, this can't be happening, denial, it isn't happening, Sometimes people feel guilt. I'm letting everyone down. Occasionally people become anxious about what else can happen and when's the next exacerbation coming. And for many, at the end of this process, there's a sense of relief that this, all of my symptoms are not in my head and it's not something worse. These emotions can occur in any order and last for any length of time. But it's important to pay attention to them and how you react to these emotions because if you're able to manage them in a positive way, it will be a great head start on the next time you bump into that emotion in the future. And believe me, it's not only at the, initial, at the time of initial diagnosis when people have these feelings, um, but it can happen at many different points um, across the disease. Um, there's a lot of concern, um, and it's very legitimate concern, about the relationship between stress and coping. And um, I'd like to present just a brief model of how stress and coping work together um, and to talk about it in a bit more detail. Typically, a person experiences stress in relation to an event, and then the comes their understanding or their interpretation of what's happening, what kind of coping skills they pull into, into operation to help with their coping or to, to help with dealing with the event. It's also important to be aware of what your resources are in managing um, the situation. And this ultimately leads to outcomes, um, hopefully, that are uh, positive and effective for you. So an event could be something really great, like um, a change in career. Um, positive things are known to cause as much stress as negative things are. Um, for some people who are neurally diagnosed, it can be very intimidating um, to, after an exacerbation, think about using a cane or some other walking device, even temporarily. That's not quite so positive, um, but a major event that people face. And I think a fairly common concern um, across the lifespan of MS for people living with MS is where's the bathroom and how can I get there? Those are all events, positive and negative, that um, can cause stress and um, have you generate a coping response. What you, how you interpret the situation um, has a large impact on how you deal with it. Um, if you consider an opportunity for a job change to be a threat, to be a danger, moving out of your comfort zone, um, it can really be a negative experience for you to think about this new job. Um, for some people, 
using a cane for the first time can actually be a relief because it's an outside, it's an external demonstration that something is wrong with them and it's an opportunity to talk with um, those that they want to about some of the difficulties that they're having. And in the end, if you decide that what is going on is a big deal or no big deal, um, will influence how you respond to what is happening. Um, there are generally two kinds of coping that we talk about. Um, one is emotion-focused coping um, that is really dealing with the, your um, emotional reaction to the situation. And the other is problem-focused coping. That's figuring out what you can do about the situation and moving forward with a plan. Um, it's typically thought that the problem-focused coping is the most effective. But in fact, there are times when there's something that's happened in relation to your MS or other aspects of your life that a combination of recognizing your emotions and letting them happen in combination with moving ahead and solving problems is the best combination for uh, coping. Certainly your resources um, influence how you are able to manage. Um, who's your social network? Um, is faith important to you? Um, organizations like Can Do Multiple Sclerosis and the MS Society are great resources for individuals living with MS. And it's also really important to have a great healthcare team behind you who works with you to make, your decision, to make decisions about your care. And to that extent, we like to focus on positive thinking. Um, and then we come to the outcome of this event. And it might be that you're not doing something exactly the way you used to. Um, you may not be playing championship chess um, in competition, but you may be able to continue the interest that you have and love in a um, more casual, less formal way while you're enjoying the sunshine. And finally, um, I think that it's important to keep in mind that there are steps to effective coping. It's important to have good information, the kind of information that is available to you through Can Do MS and other organizations. It's important to be able to communicate um, in different ways with family, with friends, with your healthcare providers. We never say that people with MS accept their MS, but it's really important to adapt to the changes that come with it. And as you're looking at how to solve specific problems um, in your life because of MS or because of other situations, don't try to go it alone. Um, shared problem solving is always more effective than doing that individually. And this in turn leads to effective planning for today, tomorrow, and the longer term future. Um, it seems to me, uh, Linda, that um, a very coping skill, a very important coping skill for individuals living with MS is to have a sense of control um, that comes from setting and meeting priorities. How does one accomplish that? Well, what I'd like to suggest is that a sense of control comes sort of in a, a pattern in that you um, you can try to have control by setting priorities, priorities of activities that are important. And then in order for those priorities to truly be priorities, you need to have active decisions, active decisions on a person's part to make time, to make um, things happen, to um, work out the details. And so if you are making those active decisions and working towards your priorities, then you will th feel that sense of control because you're doing something to try to ha have some control over um, your lifestyle. And again, as I said, these decisions Active decisions come from choices. Choices come from the priorities you've set. 
Now, in again, going back to priorities, sometimes we real, you have to be realistic about your priorities. You have to have a realistic time frame. Um, you know, we'd all love to say that I want to be rich and be able to retire by the end of next year. However, we have to be realistic about where we are in our life, where our financial needs are. Um, have we looked at our own job responsibilities and our, and our financial status? Um, sometimes you have to make um, accommodations or some you know, changes. For instance, maybe staying in an apartment financially makes a better decision um, at this time in your life. It would give you more flexibility. Um, it might r decrease your amount of respons um, household responsibilities. So when I talk about realistic, I need you to, um, in order to have a good priority, it has to be realistic to your lifestyle. And the next um, component is planning the steps. Once you've set some priorities, the only way to achieve them is to have realistic steps that um, will allow you to progress towards the priority that you have. Um, sometimes you have to make modifications along the way to those um, priorities. Sometimes you have to pull on resources. Um, remember those relationships that you have. You might need to be able to feel comfortable asking people to assist you in certain activities. Um, and then thirdly, we need to remember your energy levels, um, your how much work it takes to actually carry out a particular task. And for each individual, that is different. But you have to remember that every person and every task has a certain amount of energy that it requires, be it standing, be it um, pushing, be it lifting. Is it just the act of having to drive somewhere, do the, the activity, and then drive home? All of these take up your energy levels. And so you have to set um, – take those into consideration as you're setting realistic time frames. So um, what I want to do is just take a minute, for instance, and say your priority to give this a, a little bit more concrete um, thought, I wanted to give you an example and say your priority is staying connected and having a dinner party with your friends, but it almost seems unrealistic because there's so many parts and it requires that you grocery shop ahead of time, you prepare food, you have your house um, or your apartment ready, that you have the energy to entertain. These are all realistic questions you have to ask yourself and then you have to start planning the steps. Maybe you could buy some pre-prepared food. Maybe you could divide up amongst your friends that you're inviting that some people bring an appetizer and some bring some desserts so that everybody is a part of the, the um, steps in a, order to achieve the goal or the priority, which is having a party or a gathering of your friends. And then finally, you also want to keep in that energy level. So maybe instead of it being a late night, Friday night gathering, it's a Sunday afternoon when you've had Saturday to prepare, um, gathering your items, you know, cleaning, gathering yourself, resting up a little bit, whatever it takes, um, using the, these concepts will help you achieve those priorities that you've set. And finally, I want to um, bring, back, bring this all around into helping you understand that life is like a curving road. We have lots of choices in order to follow the road um, and to keep in control. But those, that life, just like the road, still has more curves ahead of us. And sometimes those curves might be a little more sharp or a little more uh, harder to handle, and so you may kind of feel like you're slipping off the road. Maybe exercise was important, but you haven't been able to get to it. Just because you slip off um, and fall and are kind of in off the cur off the road, we don't want you to feel that you're a failure. 
um, you have to just remember that a slip is nothing more than just another curve. And what we hope is that you take the ideas we've presented today so you can gather your thoughts and pick yourself back up and get back on that road to whatever lies ahead and whatever priorities you have in front of you. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, so much for, for that quote, Linda, and, and to you, Deb, as well. Um, certainly is hard for us to sometimes keep on track and stay positive when we have all of these hardships ahead of us, but that, that's a great reminder. Um, we did get a few questions in, um, and I think, Deborah, this, this question might be for you. Um, and, um, and Linda, if, if, if this question is good for you as well, please chime in. So the question is, do you have any recommendations for keeping the MS near the forefront of, of your mind during the quiet times without letting it limit you or hold you back? Well, um, actually, I think that while it's important to be realistic about what you can do, um, you probably don't want MS to be at the forefront of your mind during quiet times. Um, you want to be able to be in the moment and enjoy the quiet time that you're having. Um, and a lot of times, learning techniques um, like meditation, um, sometimes yoga or tai chi are, um, can help you achieve a sense of quiet that does not make MS um, the thing that's the most um, important thing in your mind when you're enjoying these quiet times. And in terms of not letting it hold you back, it's important to be realistic about setting goals that are achievable and then moving forward with confidence that what you want to do, um, if you plan carefully, is um, what you will do. Excellent. Thanks, Deb. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we actually had a few questions about career changes or just you know, talking with your employer. And the first question regarding career change is um, any suggestions about how to confront career changes or, or what type of careers might be best for someone with MS? This person currently has a very high stress job and um, does not know if it's a good fit for her. And, um, she's just looking for, you know, other avenues or, you know, if, if a career change might be best or if she should change the environment in her job to fit her MS. Do you want to take... Well, actually, I did have some that? thoughts. I, I think um, when you talk about a career change, you know, it kind of goes way back right to, you know, looking at your balanced lifestyle. You have to kind of look at what is or what is not working for them right now. Um, if they enjoy, that's what some people might consider a high-stress job, but if they enjoy it and they still feel like they can keep a balance with the remaining parts of their life, then a career change may not be necessary. However, if you're finding that the career is or the demands of that particular job you have are overwhelming you and you don't have that balance, that's when you may need to sit back and say, what changes, what modifications can I make um, to try to put my life in balance. And, you know, I, unfortunately, whether you want to change careers or not is a little bit personal, but you have to kind of work yourself through those questions about where you want to be versus where you are. Sure. Yeah, those are um, definitely like, tough questions. Sorry, go ahead, Deb. Yeah. Um, I would also say that this is not necessarily a decision that you need to make on your own that while it's important for a person to assess what's good about their job and what's less desirable about their job, um, there are experts out there in career counseling, um, oftentimes available through the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, that can help people sort out what their interests are, what their skill sets are, and to be thinking about career changes 
well in advance of the time when you feel like you've exhausted the current position that you're in. Um, it's part of the thinking ahead and preparing ahead. But if you feel as if in five years this job is going to be too much for you, it's quite reasonable to seek out the services and work with a vocational counselor to um, have time to prepare for a transition. And fortunately, um, at this point in time, health insurance is no longer an impediment to changing jobs. It used to be that people were so concerned about um, pre-existing illnesses and that inhibiting um, them from changing insurance is because they wouldn't have coverage for their MS. But the recent changes in the law, as long as a person is continuously covered, um, they can't be denied insurance by a new employer. Excellent. Great. Thank you for that, Deb. Um, so we have another question about, um, and Deb, this might be for you as well, um, uh, about communication with, with their spouse. And they're asking if, if you have any suggestions on how to help my husband understand you know, the day-to-day -day symptoms, um, the varying day-to-day -day symptoms that this person experiences. She feels that he dismisses her spasticity, her, um, her mood swings, and um, you know, he thinks that because she's not in a relapse, that she shouldn't really have any problems. Um, and so you know, she's trying to figure out how to communicate with her husband about these symptoms or sometimes invisible symptoms that she's having to help him understand her, her situation a little better. Um, well, it sounds as if there's a pretty significant um, need for both education and perhaps some coaching about communication. Uh, it's very important to understand that individuals have symptoms um, most of the time with MS, whether they're in an exacerbation or not. There are those invisible symptoms that are difficult to understand. Um, to the extent possible, I would recommend that this person encourage her husband to use the resources of the um, Can Do MS and the MS Society to learn more about MS. Um, to ask him and to encourage him to come with her to um, one of her medical appointments so that perhaps a bit of informal education could be provided by her healthcare providers about MS um, to her husband. And I think it's really important to keep in mind um, that there's a benefit to couples counseling and families counseling. Um, Living with MS is a circumstance that most people have never dreamed of having to manage. And they just don't have a roadmap for that. And it can be quite helpful to work with a mental health professional to encourage communication and to um, sometimes manage that communication if it's particularly difficult uh, between a, a couple who are at different points in understanding the MS. Excellent. Thanks, Deb. Um, and Linda, I have a question for you. And um, it, this person is asking how, um, how she can balance exercise and activity with rest and when to know um, too much is too much and when to know when to rest and, and to kind of stop and give herself a break. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I think, you know, Taking time, exercise, um, we encourage that definitely, this, uh, you know, MS does not mean you automatically need to stop exercising. The Can Do um, program has um, emphasized that for years now. But I think what's important is to look at how your body is responding to the exercise that you're participating in. And that can change. It can, you know, how you respond this month um, may be different than next month. Um, it's certainly the summer heat can change how you respond to an exercise program. And so um, what is important is that a person takes time and looks at how they're responding and kind of learns to pace themselves. You do a little and then if you can, you rest a little or do something a little bit less strenuous, and you 
figure out what, how your body responds, how soon or how much time you need to recover, and learning to keep track of that so that you don't push yourself conti- repeatedly to the point of exhaustion and then needing several days of rest in order to get moving again. Yeah, excellent. No, that's great, Linda. It's, it's a great reminder um, of, of how to you know, keep things in balance. Um, we actually had several questions come in about coping and keeping emotions under control. There's a few questions that came in um, during the registration process. And so, Deb, I think this might be a good one for, for you to tackle. Um, and the question is just that. How, do you have recommendations for how to keep emotions under control? And um, we're finding that a lot of our registrants and participants are finding it difficult to distinguish between appropriate emotions from um, you know, irrational emotions that are stemming from their MS? Um, I think that the first thing I would like to say about that is that our emotions are emotions. Yeah. And they're not necessarily either rational or out of control or uncontrolled because of MS. Um, so that it's really hard to distinguish it's true that there are mood swings that, and that people's um, mood and their response to situations can vary um, with MS, and it can be a direct cause of MS. But what's important is that when you're experiencing negative emotions, um, that's something that's really important to pay attention to. And it is likely that some of these mood swings are related to MS. Um, Regardless of the source of the negative emotions or the mood swings, the important thing to do is manage them. And MS is definitely, um, I'm sorry, depression is definitely more common in MS uh, than people in the general population. And we think that we understand that that's partially reactive because something has happened that you don't want, um, didn't ask for, don't want to continue to live with. And some of it can be um, a direct result of um, changes in the brain. It can also be because of some of the medications. Um, We all know that steroids can make people turn into raging bulls um, while we've been meek and mild. It's important to discuss these changes with your health care provider um, and to be open to recommendations for considering medication to help manage mood and um, also consider the opportunity for um, participating in counseling to make you, and a lot of times there are physiologic changes that people experience um, before they feel an emotion. Their body may tense, um, they may feel tingles in the back of their, their head. Um, they may feel like they are really anxious. If people become aware of some of those trigger signals, it's possible that they can recognize them and do something to short, short circuit that negative mood from going into full blast. So um, I think that it's important to discuss these emotions with your healthcare provider to be open to interventions um, that are very effective and some of the most effective treatments that we have for these symptoms. Um, And to be kind to yourself and to recognize that if there are situations that you're not able to manage, that maybe what you need to do is to apologize and to say, I need a break. Um, it's hard to do when you're in the moment, but the more in control you feel when you're not having these emotional difficulties, the more in control you're likely to feel when they do occur. Great. Thanks, Deb. That's, that's, um, that's a very helpful tip. Um, we got another question in um, through our registration um, form, and um, Linda, maybe you can help with this. And Without knowing exactly the personal um, 
personal factors for this person. They're asking at what point should they consult with a physical therapist about their gait issues. Um, I think the key question to, I mean, it is important along the way to be in touch with a physical therapist to talk about their gait. Um, and hopefully what we want is to, at any point, if they feel like walking has become become a chore or is exhausting or if safety has become a component. If there's falls and there's um, concern about an injury, I mean, hopefully you don't get to a point where you're pushing yourself to walk to a place and it may not even be that far, but before you know it, you're falling and, and breaking a bone or needing stitches. We don't want you to get to that point. There are lots of little things along the way, and I think um, at any point when you start to feel like you hesitate to walk or walking is a struggle, that's always a good time to have um, a meeting with a physical therapist just to discuss some options. Great, excellent. Could I add sure. just a teeny little plug? Um, very few people live um, in areas where there's a comprehensive care center for multiple sclerosis. And it's important for them to, to put together their own team um, of physical therapists, of occupational therapists, um, neurologists, and some sort of mental health provider. And the time to do that is when they're feeling well and they have the emotional energy to make those contacts. Um, it's not a lifelong contract with an OT or a PT or a psychologist. Um, but if you establish a relationship with that person when things are relatively calm and under control, it's much easier to reach out to them in the future when there are difficulties going on. Excellent. Thank you. And along that same note, using um, your resources, the MS Center, to help you find those contacts um, to build that team is really important. Sure. Yeah, and I do want to remind everyone that, you know, if you haven't already, um, you can contact the National MS Society to find out um, you know, to find out how you can contact your local chapter if there's one in your area, and hopefully you can um, find some support groups and meet some professionals um, through those means. So, you know, there are resources out there for you, um, you know, to to be able to get that care, health care, or or even just meet other people who have MS um, that might be going through the same experiences that you are. Um, so on that note, I just I wanted to thank everyone for joining us on tonight's webinar and, and especially to Deb and Linda for all of your expertise and for all of your great tips and, and, and just keeping things, you know, grounded for, for everyone who's participating and to, you know, not get overwhelmed with their MS. Um, before I um, introduce our webinar for next month, um, I did just want to share with you some of Can Do MS resources. Um, you can find all of this on our website at um, mscando.org. Um, if you did have questions tonight and you didn't get them answered, we do have um, a question and answer portal on our website. It's actually called Ask the Can Do Team. And you can type in a question. Uh, we'll receive it on our end, and a programs consultant will be able to answer that question for you depending on what your question is. And at times, we will post those questions and answers on our website, so you can also just browse through our uh, Q&A portal to see you know, previously asked questions and answers. We also have our e-news, which is a monthly um, um, electronic email uh, that we send out to our, our database um, just explaining some different upcoming events and some additional resources that we might have to offer. And we, those are all stored on our website as well. And we have a library of articles. Um, they're short you know, articles for you to read on a various number of topics. Um, written by our programs consultants, and those two are uh, housed on our website. And our next uh, webinar is on May 13th, uh, same time at 8 p.m., and these are for all the parents out there with MS. Um, the title is Effective Parenting, Balancing MS and Family. Um, or Balancing Family and MS. And we have three presenters for that evening. We have a psychologist, Peggy Crawford, Laura Kingston, who's an OT, um, and also Jen Smartka, who is a, um, a nurse. And all three of these women are great mothers and um, are 
very dedicated programs consultants for us, so it will be a great, great program. Um, so please feel free to register for that program on our website. Um, and thank you for participating tonight. Once this presentation is over, you'll see a survey appear on your computer screen. So we just ask that you take a couple seconds to complete that sh uh, survey and share your input. It always helps us improve on our webinars. Um, you'll also receive a copy of tonight's webinar slides in your email, um, so keep a lookout for those. And again, thank you Deb and Linda for um, all of your contributions this evening. And um, thanks again, and have a wonderful evening. You're welcome.